Hello. We, I got a fun topic for you today. <laughs> Though it's very complicated. You know, the fact that it's a fun topic is not going to make the material any easier. In fact, it's kind of complicated. Anyway, we're going to talk about sexual conditioning. And this is an area that uh, I've been uh, heavily involved with, uh, together with a wonderful group of uh, graduate students and uh, other research uh, associates over the years. We've been working on this uh, for about 30 years now. And uh, I know a lot about it. It's going to be hard for me to fit into a few uh, few minutes uh, what, uh, what the basic story is. Uh, but when... Uh, I first got started on this. Uh, uh, some people thought, well, what do you mean sexual conditioning? I mean, sexual behavior is so important and so much dependent on the presence of sexual hormones that isn't understanding the hormonal and neural mechanism of sexual behavior. Doesn't that pr provide you with a complete understanding of sexual behavior? Well, what does learning have to add to the issues of hormonal control? And uh, how much you go about studying those learning variables? Well, if, if uh, Pavlov uh, was confronted with similar issues, uh, well, f eating is really important, salivating is really important, and it's controlled by all kinds of unconditioned physiological mechanisms. What? Why should you add, or what does learning have to do with it? Obviously, uh, that didn't discourage Pavlov from studying learning mechanisms associated with digestion. And uh, you'll see that there are a lot of learning mechanisms that are also play a role in sexual behavior. But uh, we could start off uh, by uh, uh, considering how you might study this in a kind of a, a, a primitive or impoverished laboratory environment. The next slide shows you the basic uh, uh, issue of sexual behavior. You encounter a sexual partner, which is the unconditioned stimulus, which then generates uh, sexual behavior, which is the you are. Now, to add a conditioning component to this, uh, you can precede uh, the uh, uh, access to the sexual partner with a conditioned stimulus. It could be a light or a tone. Uh, so just we have found that it could be virtually any kind of stimulus that precedes the well, access to the sexual partner. If you uh, do a number of these CSUS pairings, then uh, in pretty uh, quick order, uh, the conditioned stimulus comes to elicit a sexual anticipatory behavior. So some of the uh, uh, literature on sexual conditioning uh, is aptly described by this uh, uh, diagram here, but not all of it. Uh, so the, the next arrows that, that are going to appear illustrate a, a really important additional uh, form of learning in the sexual behavior system, whereby the conditioned stimulus actually uh, modifies your perception and your tendency to react to the unconditioned stimul stimulus and how you react to the unconditioned stimulus so that it also alters the actual sexual behavior. And those alterations in sexual behavior can be so profound that they influence the number of offsprings that result from a sexual encounter. So uh, the, uh, in a large measure, uh, sexual conditioning involves a modification in how organisms respond to unconditioned stimuli that uh, ordinary trigger sexual activity. So uh, this is a uh, this diagram provides kind of a simple uh, laboratory-based uh, sort of analysis of a situation. You can think about this in a more complex fa fashion, uh, which is illustrated in the next slide, where uh, we consider how sexual activity might occur in, under natural circumstances. So if we may uh, look at the next slide. <laughs> In uh, this, uh, uh, these drawings are uh, taken to illustrate the sexual behavior of domesticated quail or, or, or uh, the Coternix uh, quail, uh, which in the uh, wild uh, live in grassy areas. Now, uh, before a male uh, uh, can, can engage in sexual behavior, he has to find a female. So uh, his behavior is initially uh, reflects a general search behavior. If he finds where the female might be, a clump of grass, or maybe the female's head pops or is visible above the grass, then you could get 
this focal search and courtship kind of responses. And then, of course, when uh, the two of them are closer together, you can get actual copulatory behavior. So the sexual behavior system has three different kinds of responses, general search, focal search, and copulatory behavior. And you can condition each of those different kinds of activities. And uh, you can condition those cues uh, to do general contextual cues, uh, the meadow where all of this takes place, uh, uh, or you can condition them to an arbitrary stimulus like we talked about in the laboratory paradigm, a tone or a light. Or you could condition these things to species typical cues, which are uh, minimal uh, stimuli that the female uh, provides that the, the male has access to. And, and this slide illustrates what those minimal cues are. Uh, and namely, they involve the female's uh, head and a little bit of her neck feathers, uh, which uh, without learning don't, don't elicit much response, but the uh, male could quickly learn to become uh, uh, responsive to them. So there are actually three different categories of conditioned stimuli that you could employ. And the next slide shows you how uh, and you might organize these. So uh, on each row represents a different type of uh, condition stimulus. You get these uh, species typical cues such as the female's head uh, uh, and uh, plumage. Uh, you, get, you, you can use localized arbitrary stimuli uh, like a light of some sort, or you can use contextual cues. And, uh, and then we're interested in general search behavior, focal search behavior, and copulatory behavior. And before conditioning, uh, only the shaded parts of this grid uh, show much control. So uh, you get focal search behavior unconditionally to species typical cues to some extent. And of course, you get copulatory behavior if the, the female is, full, uh, is totally accessible. Contextual cues are going to just generate general search behavior, and a lot of the other cells in this table are empty. <laughs> That's before conditioning. Now, on the next slide shows you what happens after conditioning. And now we're, you know, this slide summarizes uh, uh, probably a, a quarter of a century of research. There are a lot of different experiments that have contributed to this slide. And... Uh, um, the, uh, the stars represent uh, actual conditioning effects. Uh, the, uh, the stars are data from quail experiments. The uh, squares are data from rat experiments. And uh, what you can see, let's look at the middle set of bars. So arbitrary localized stimuli can come to elicit general search behavior uh, uh, with sexual conditioning. Uh, they certainly generate focal search behavior. That's a sign tracking phenomenon that uh, there's been a lot of uh, research on. And the interesting thing is you can actually condition copulatory behavior to arbitrary uh, localized cues, which is uh, uh, a very, uh, it, which provides an animal model of how sexual fet fetishes are acquired, sexual fetishes are, are sexual responses, some are copulatory responses to entirely artificial, <laughs> arbitrary kinds of things. Uh, contextual cues uh, can become conditioned to elicit general search. They elicit general search unconditionally, but there's also conditioning effects that enhance general search behavior in both quail and rats. Uh, focal search can also be generated by contextual cues. Uh, <laughs> The top row is also very interesting because the top row involves species typical cues. So ordinarily we think about those as unconditioned stimuli, uh, but uh, limited uh, cues of just the female's head, if it's paired with the opportunity to copulate a female, that will come to elicit uh, focal search responses. It will also elicit copulatory behavior as conditioned responses. So you can actually condition instinctive behavior, if you will. That's the top row. And finally, you've got all these blue arrows, which are, uh, uh, are uh, in some ways the most interesting part of it. And that is where certain kinds of stimulus uh, it increases the efficacy of other types of cues. So the origin of the arrow uh, represents the stimulus and the destination of the arrow represents the stimulus that whose function it modifies.
So uh, contextual cues can modify the effectiveness of arbitrary localized stimuli. They can modify the effectiveness of species typical cues. Arbitrary cues can modify the effectiveness of species typical cues. And contextual cues can modify the effectiveness of species typical cues. So uh, species typical stimuli, which are usually call, uh, considered to sort of control instincts, how they function is determined by conditioning effects that modulate their effectiveness. And, and usually the modulation is an in, uh, is, is that makes increases their efficacy. So there are lots of different kinds of conditioning effects. Uh, sexual conditioning is not only possible, <laughs> <laughs> but it occurs under a wide range of circumstances and it substantially modifies the entire sexual behavior system so that it modifies all the different response components, general search, focal search, confirmatory behavior, and, uh, and it uh, uh, includes all these modulatory influences. Now, now to show you... <laughs> what some of these conditioning effects are, particularly uh, conditioning effects that involve limited species typical cues. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the, uh, the photograph uh, just above my head, <laughs> right up there, uh, shows uh, approach behavior to uh, a, uh, an, artificial, an, an object that uh, has a taxidermically prepared uh, female head. So very limited. Uh, female cues, uh, ordinarily, these uh, cues are not enough to generate an approach response. But if uh, an object like this is paired, is ex used as a condition stimulus, paired with copulatory reinforcement, those cues are going to elicit uh, approach behavior. And they're actually going to elicit copulatory behavior. So uh, the uh, figure on the, on the left shows a male quail copulating with this object in a <clears throat> kind of a variation of a sexual fetish kind of uh, response. Now, uh, one of the uh, things that have come out of this line of work uh, uh, has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, conditioning effects uh, substantially modify how normal sexual interactions occur and a list of those modifications is uh, shown in the next slide. So what we're looking at here is uh, condition changes in how a male responds to a female sexual partner. Okay, so we're not, here we're not looking, these, these are these modulatory arrows that I showed you in uh, one of the preceding slides. Uh, and modulatory arrows that end up in uh, on the top row. Uh, in response to condition stimuli, males copulate with a female with a shorter latency. Uh, females show greater receptivity uh, uh, in the presence of a male if that if they've been conditioned. Uh, there is increased courtship behavior. Those data are from a fish species, the blue gourami. Uh, uh, in experiments by Karen Hollis and her students. Uh, <clears throat> um, animals showed greatly increased efficiency in copulation. And, uh, and that's true with both quail and, and, uh, and blue gouramis. Uh, if a male copulates with a female uh, following a condition stimulus, he releases more sperm. And if he really releases more sperm, He's going to fertilize more eggs. And if you fertilize more eggs, you're going to produce more offspring. So there's increased numbers of offsprings produced. And uh, this, these mechanisms uh, operate so that uh, uh, sexually conditioned males actually uh, uh, have a significant advantage in uh, uh, sexual competition situations. So what, uh, what does all this mean? Well, uh, of course, sexual behavior is important in producing the next generation uh, 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 members of the species. The offspring uh, serve to carry on the genes for uh, for that uh, for that species, and we usually think about uh, genetic transmission as being primarily governed by physiological processes. This shows you, these kinds of experiments show you that learning processes uh, 
can influence reproductive success, which means they can influence uh, the genes that are passed along to future generations, which uh, means that learning mechanisms are actually pretty heavily involved in evolutionary change. So uh, this puts learning at the heart of evolutionary processes. So uh, I think these, these kinds of experiments are, are tremendously important. And uh, I hope uh, I've convinced you that that's the case. Thanks very much for your attention and uh, take care.